I wanted to start today by telling you a couple of stories from Dr. Jefferson and I about working with advocates. And how many of you here, how many of you here identify your primary role as advocacy? And how many of you identify your primary role as leadership or working in a shelter, administration, something like that? Okay. And how many of you feel like at different times you wear different hats, advocate, doer, and leader? Most of us, right? So as you, as you participate in this session, the challenge that I have for you is to, to ask you to consider yourself kind of leapfrogging between these roles. I think if we're good at this work, we're always doing that. But I'm speaking today from a position of being a leader in sheltering. So I want to start just by telling a couple telling you a couple of the things I've experienced. Um, advocates are the most important people in my lives. They're why I have my job, and they're also the most challenging thing in the work I do. I have at different times been emojied into a tyrannical monster riding a scorpion. Um, compared to Hitler and various Nazi figures, um, called dictator in like every word for dictator, and um, also drawn a couple of different times, not just emoji. So I've had advocates also be just about as mean as you can be to me. Um, but I, a long time ago, I knew if I wanted to survive, I was going to stop taking that stuff personally and start turning it into action. So now Ellen. <laughs> so she told me that I had to tell you guys things that people have said about me. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I've had some real great ones. Um, I've been called the kindergarten teacher who secretly wants to murder children. Um, people think I'm pocketing all of the money that comes into Austin Pets Alive. Um, I'm trying to think what else. It's great. I, if you were at our earlier session, I really try very, very, very hard not to watch what's going on on social media because it does really hurt you. You know, we're, we're even leaders are people, and it's hard to... Um, distance yourself from really hurtful things people are tr saying about you or trying to to get your attention with and um, so I really have learned over the years to just not read it and try to find the the kernel of truth somewhere else other than social media so people usually have to tell me what somebody has said about me and I try not to listen <laughs> Ellen doesn't see all the emojis that get made of her <laughs> though that picture that last picture that was long hair us that was a year ago. So there we are with our long hair. OK, so it's not easy to work with, ad with advocates. Um, and I just, before Ellen talks, I want to say that this slide um, is in here for a reason. It's not just because it's wild. It, this is uh, my shelter in the 1950s when they had a deposit box where dogs went on the bottom. And there was a screen separating the top and the bottom, and cats went on the top. So as you can imagine, this was, for the most part, really fun for the dogs, um, really horrifying for the cats, but this was a 24-hour drop box. And this drop box is not here anymore, and the kill rate is not 75% anymore because of advocates. And it's a good reminder, as frustrated as I feel, that they're the reason that this kind of thing doesn't exist anymore. Definitely. And, um, and you know my whole story. I was an advocate before I became a leader of an organization. And so um, it is really interesting how we kind of jump from um, hat to hat. But um, we need to keep that in mind because the hat that you're wearing the most can definitely color how you see the other people wearing different hats. Um, and I think what, something that's really dawned on me recently is that the institutions that we're trying to affect are really, they are institutions. They are institutions like what we used to put all the mentally ill in. They're institutions like orphanages. They're institutions that are really, really, really difficult to change. And unfortunately, all of those institutions change because of public outcry. They don't change because somebody intrinsically wants them to be better the, uh, uh, of the people that are running them. And um, it doesn't mean that the want isn't there. It just means that what actually causes the change comes from outside. And so I think that's really, really, really important for all of us to remember because if we get too comfortable in the role of being the leader or, or the part of the institution and unwilling to interact with the advocates, we're missing a real opportunity for any kind of real change to occur. Um, 
And uh, I think that it's really illustrated recently, and I asked Leanne if it was okay to say this, um, but we have um, in Austin, the city shelter is going through a transition right now, and a lot of the changes that needed to happen didn't happen until she quit. And then there's people coming out of the woodwork that are talking to city council about, about her quitting, and now all of a sudden there's a bunch of money that's gonna go to Austin Animal Center, when it would have been um, better to work with that leader and actually get things put in place when we know somebody who's committed to no-kill is in there and wants the animals to live. So it's a good reminder that institutions um, and governments are reactive, not proactive. And so hoping they're going to see the light and do better typically doesn't work. Um, and that trickles down. So you have governments, the people who are the policy makers, make decisions based on who's causing the biggest fuss. And that, that trickle down effect goes to the people who are actually leading shelters and leading organizations. And they don't have the ability to be a thought leader because they're forced to keep reacting to everything around them. And we find that even in nonprofit, you react to the biggest problem on your plate. You have a million problems, whichever everyone is the loudest is the one that you're going to be spending your time with because you have to choose something. So it creates this weird dynamic where you're never really stepping in front. You're, you're always trying to react to things. Um, so, this is um, a perfect example of, um, and I, I'll let you speak about Susan, but it turns into this whack-a-mole complaint scenario where you're just trying to get things to go back underground, you know, and get them off your plate so you can focus on at least one thing at a time. And what happens is that you can easily get, and I've done this, you can easily get into a mode where you're whack a mole everything indiscriminately and you're not listening to what's actually coming to you that does need your attention and does need to have some cha change associated with it. And um, the, the complaining and the lack of response causes a negative impact on the organization's reputation. Often a director can lose their job. People within the organization can lose their job one way or the other. They resign or they quit. I mean resign or they get fired. And um, the inside of the organization can fester between the people who are advocating for change and the people who are resisting change. And that creates a toxicity level that is really, really hard to come back from. Do you want to? Speak about the Susan. Does anybody know Susan Russell in this room? So Susan took a job as the executive director of Chicago Animal Care and Control. If you've ever been to that shelter, it's one of the toughest, saddest shelter environments I've ever seen. There's a police officer at the door with a gun who greets you um, and takes your driver's license before you're allowed to see any animals. And when you're allowed to see them, you're only allowed to look in the rooms, or this was how it was three years ago. Um, the save rate was abysmal, it was 50 to 60 percent, and Susan went in, she was an attorney who had been an advocate, and she went in to create change in the organization, and she started to create change. She came to this conference, she, came, she went to every conference and started to create change and increase the save rate um, and to fight for the lives of the dogs and cats in her shelter, and some no anti-no-kill advocates latched on and said that by by trying to save lives, she was, quote, warehousing animals because they weren't being killed at the end of their stray hold anymore. They were being let live. Um, she wasn't killing for space or time limits. And they started to kind of campaign against her, and they got some political traction. And um, I speak about this because Susan speaks about it so openly, but she was fired uh, from her job at Chicago Animal Care and Control. So what happened after that is where it gets really interesting because Susan had about six job offers within a month of shelters that said, you want to be no-kill? We need a no-kill director. Can you come help us? She ended up at Philadelphia Animal Care and Control where they embrace her life-saving ethic. And in Chicago, change is happening. The advocates there are now following the model that was followed in, in Austin, and they're realizing through what happened to Susan, the power of connecting to political advocacy, and now they're using it to bring Chicago the other way. Um, and so it was tumultuous and really traumatic for Susan, but Susan landed on her feet, and, uh, and now Chicago is um, changing, um, hopefully for the better. It's you too. Oh, that's my shelter, Pima. So PAC started out as Pima Animal Control Center, taking in this is just 2013, okay? So this isn't like 1974. 2013, taking in 28,000 animals a year, um, killing 15,000 of those animals. And so advocates said, this is horrible. 
because the shelter had opened itself up to volunteers and other advocates, they were saying this isn't acceptable. And the first change that happened was that they changed the name. Um, they changed the name to Pima Animal Care Center to change the ethic of what the shelter was doing. And, but still in, 20, the, in 2015, the euthanasia rate was still really high and advocates kept pushing and pushing and they kept volunteering and they kept showing pictures and stories of the animals. And in 2014, a bond was passed because of those advocates who went out and fought for it. It's the only bond that's passed in Pima County um, in a very long time. A bond was passed to build a brand new state-of-the-art shelter. And with those advocacy changes that changed the building, um, we went from a 45% save rate to a 90% save rate. And that was all because advocates kept pushing uh, pushing us forward over years and years and not ever saying this is good enough. Everybody wants, nobody's in this field, whether they're attacking it or they're um, working in it and not, and not responding. Nobody, I, my, I'm hopeful that nobody doesn't want the best thing for the animals. And I think our purpose of this is trying to help tease out how do we talk to each other? How do we come, become more effective as a group rather than us um, fighting all the time. And um, I think that we need to remember that, that nobody is going to waste their time in this field if they're not interested in making it better for animals. I can't imagine anybody spending the time and effort that they do on um, social media. There's definitely some people out there that are trying to take down no kill, but that's very few compared to the number of people who actually just want it better for, um, for the animals that are in our care. If, in, in general, if you're ever really mad at more than 2% of the advocates or volunteers, you're mad at too many people. Like, there may be in your organization a small group of people that are truly toxic, and I think in every community I've worked in that exists, but it's a very, very small number. You'll have that bottom 1% to 2%, and then you'll have the 88% that are trying to do the right thing and help, and then at the very top you'll have the 2%, which are your absolute angels, your, your palmers, um, and your volunteers and advocates who will be there every single day by your side, but almost everybody's in that 88%. So we've tried to create kind of the dissenter lifestyle, and what, lifestyle, life cycle, um, and what we're trying to communicate with this is that it's a circular problem, and so um, typically people who are in that position of having to, do I need to move this? Okay, sorry. Um, people that are in the position of um, complaining and not being in a position of doing, a lot of time that's because they don't feel like they can do anything. And so the complaints come rapid fire, um, but typically it's because they don't feel like they can get any traction any other way. So, um, and then that typically turns off whoever actually can do something and so then they don't do anything because they're turned off and then the problem gets bigger it gets escalated it goes to more people the dissenter doesn't go away because they do actually care about the issue and um, eventually it gets big enough that somebody responds and hopefully makes an improvement and so it's kind of like this um, this, this whole thing, it just starts over again. As soon as something gets fixed, there's gonna be something else that goes wrong and then it'll start back over again. And so was, I feel some comfort in trying to understand that because it, it makes it easier for any of us to be able to deal with it and to try to take ourselves out of the mix. I talked about how painful it is to be skewered on social media or demonized for the work that we're doing. And um, if, you, if you take a step back and try to remove your personal self from the situation and think about it kind of clinically, it makes it a little bit easier to actually do the right thing and be part of the game with, with the dissenters. Or maybe you're the dissenter, but try to be part of the whole scenario. All right, so we're going to move to an activity. And um, let's see, do you, how do you want to, do you want to? Okay, so. This is the after lunch session, and the after lunch session is always the Wednesday of the conference, you know? Like, it's like Wednesday, it's your like hump time. So we're gonna get up and get moving, but this is not an arbitrary let's do an exercise thing. This is real. So what you're gonna do is we're gonna put you in trios, groups of three. 
So that's going to be the first hard thing we have to do. The second hard thing we have to do is find a piece of paper as a trio on the board. Assert your own space. So you may take your paper and take it somewhere else. Make sure you have a marker. And then we're going to have you creatively divide up your paper into five relatively same sized chunks. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be practicing responding to real life advocate situations. Um, we wrote these from things that we deal with almost every single day. But the hard part is that you're going to have three minutes per question to come up with three action items to do immediately. So you're going to get three minutes per section, and you're going to be telling us what action steps do you take for, the, for that group of advocates. Um, and so we're going to move through five of these. Um, really quickly and then come back together as a group and talk about them. We have a few ground rules that we can, um, we'll put up there, oops, went too far. Um, okay, so first step is understand the motivations. Is this coming from that small percent of people that actually just want to take the whole movement down or is this coming from a place of actually trying to help? Um, second is, so you have to determine that as you're going, you don't have to write it down. Um, if you're assuming positive motives, which we hope you are, then um, you know you can start talking, put some of these things into action if you, if you feel like it's the right thing to do. Um, finding the kernel of truth, it would be really helpful reading these and see if what you think is the kernel of truth that might be in there. And, um, and then you tell us, yeah, based on uh, your experience and where you're coming from, plus some of the tips that we're providing up front, we'll talk about them in depth. So it's not, not like the conference is only, I mean, the session is only you guys putting this on paper. It's going to help us have a better discussion about what to do um, in these situations. So using these guidelines, they're going to answer these scenarios. So let's go ahead and organize into groups of three with a piece of paper at the wall. And where are the markers right now? If you don't have a marker, oh, you so many of you have markers. If you don't have a marker, is the bag somewhere? It's a big yellow bag that says Kristen on it. All right, we have markers in the back. So grab a piece of paper, find your space. <laughs> One of your long stay dogs and volunteer favorites is at risk of being killed for behavioral reasons. You know volunteers have been posting his photos and story on the internet, and he has at least three people who visit him daily. You're planning to euthanize the dog if it doesn't get out of the shelter in a couple of days. You're worried about the volunteer's reaction to this dog dying. So you have to take some action steps. You have three minutes. I asked you to divide your paper up into five equal sections, because we're going to do this five times three action steps you would take in this situation. In this case, volunteers are advocates. They are advocating for the life of this animal. We're going to move to scenario number two. Your shelter is hosting a fee-waived adoption promotion over Halloween. A volunteer wrote an op-ed in a local publication stating that fee-waived adoptions should be banned because they lead to pets being sold by dog fighters as bait. The author also stated no black pets should be allowed to be adopted over Halloween because they are used for sacrifices. The op-ed has drawn the attention of other local media who are asking the question, are fee-waived adoptions a danger to pets? This is a tough one and it happens all the time. So three minutes, go. Okay, we're gonna move to case study number three. Okay, a group of volunteers and members of the public have a social media page called Hold the Shelter Accountable. Anyone can post on the page and it's frequently used as a sounding board for complaints of any kind. Two days ago, a volunteer posted a photo of a dog cowering in the back of its kennel and wrote, the dogs don't get anything. There's no food in this dog's kennel and who knows the last time it's eaten or been let out. Under the post, more than 200 people have commented and among the comments are calls to protest the conditions of dogs being warehoused. You receive a telephone call from a well-respected government leader in your community who has seen the post. They ask, what's going on over there? Okay. 
Okay, we're getting ready to move on to scenario number four. A disease outbreak. You have a disease outbreak in your shelter and you've created an emergency containment plan which involves isolating half of the shelter. Advocates and volunteers are complaining they cannot visit or walk the dogs who are isolated. They're claiming the shelter is, quote, hiding something and they're starting rumors that animals are secretly dying in the isolation areas. You have found several volunteers entering the isolation areas with treats for the dogs and have had to direct them to leave. This is a hard one. Okay, we are moving on to our fifth and final scenario. Cats. You have a group of 12 volunteers who don't believe the senior cats are getting enough attention. They say they're, quote, second class citizens and have requested a meeting with management to talk about how to improve the situation. Your save rate of senior cats is 85%. Okay while your save rate of kittens is only at 60%. So that last sentence is key information. Go. So when you are done with your posters, you're going to be coming and sitting in the room. And if you can sit to, close to the front of the room, that's better. OK. So you're sitting close to the front of the room, if you're OK with that. Um, and some of you have your posters, some of you don't. Some of you are going to have to go grab them. But this will get us started. So what? Um, Ellen and I did is we walked around and we put smiley faces on it, the question that you did that we thought would be a good example for the group to go over. Um, so, it, so some of them were like kind of what we thought would be average answers. Some of them were like, wow, that's amazing. I never thought of that. And some of them were like, this one could use work. So uh, what we're going to do is ask you if you have a smiley face on a particular question when we're on that question, just to line up on the side over here. And we're going to have you share your answer to that question. Does that make sense? Cool, so let's have the number, the people who had a smiley face next to number one, let's have you, uh, one of you stick yours right up there. So this is behavior dog. And I think when I asked how many of you have dealt with this situation, a heck of a lot of you raised your hand. My name is Nick Cullen. I'm the director of Kern County Animal Services. Um, we had a pretty lively discussion about this, I think, because all three of us have been through the situation relatively recently. Um, so number one, we talked about inviting the people that were, that were intimately involved with the dog. Um, we want to have a face-to-face -face discussion. We want to involve them in the decision. We want to hear them out. Most of our answers are, have a running theme of communication, but um, we're going we're gonna to maybe even in talk about the possibility of some outside behavioralists maybe giving us some opinions, maybe even some trainers in-house that we might have. We want to get as many people in a room as we can to have a discussion. Uh, we also thought about seeking temporary foster care. Okay, can we seek temporary foster care to keep the animal um, in a foster home until we can maybe seek out some other sort of uh, live outcome for the animal? And then third, um, we're going to make sure that we do our due diligence. We're going to go over all of the documentation, all of the communication that's happened that has led to the decision for the animal to begin with um, to make sure there's no, there's no, uh, no gaps, that we're not, we're not missing anything. Um, that we should have made a different decision on. So that's what we came to. Thank you. Thanks so much. OK, I'm Abby. I'm uh, brand new to the Austin Animal Center. So um, my teammates and I dealt with what they've dealt with in the past and also what I've dealt with at my previous shelter. 
Um, so very similar, but also we talked about that usually by the time you put the notification out, your volunteers know about it. It's already been discussed with staff and the leadership team, behavior team. Um, so we're going to meet with volunteers and discuss the euthanasia protocol that we've already been through. So we've gone through the steps to justify if we think that the animal needs to be euthanized because of behavior and everything that we think that we can do to fix the problem without it being euthanasia. So that's going to be the stuff that he talked about, which is outside trainers, um, other resources, sanctuaries, things like that. Um, so then at that point, you share the due diligence that you did. You give um, the volunteers the deadline of when the euthanasia will happen unless they can find a, an option that is reasonable and safe. Um, and then you come back um, before, shortly before that deadline and say, hey, what are your solutions? Let's talk about it. Let's see if this is something that we can do or if you do need to proceed with euthanasia. Thank you. Um, thanks to both of those speakers for keeping it brief too. I know it's like attempting to explain all this out a lot and I appreciate you both stuck to the, just what was on the piece of paper. What of those two, is there anything else that you talked about in your groups that you think needs to be added onto the li list of things they just came up with? Yes. In our group, we also mentioned creating a compelling post on social media, on the shelter's social media, about how this pet is a teacher's pet, it's a favorite, and why it means so much to people, and asking the public support for that as well. Thanks. Ellen, what do you think? If these were your staff, is there anything else you would tell them to do or not do that they've mentioned? No, I, I mean, I think that I starred those, so I, I feel like those are really good answers, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll move on to number two, the Halloween adoption event. All right, so if you have a smiley, who has a smiley face next to that? Come on up. I'm Sophia. I'm with Bark Animal Shelter and Adoptions here, or not here, down in Houston. Hey. Hey. <laughs> so we thought it was extremely important to provide data, the Maddie's Fund research that or not recently, has been shared quite a bit. We wanted to make sure and share that with the public and with volunteers. We thought we also would like to invite media to the event so that media could actually interview adopters, get a sense of the warm atmosphere of this adoption event, and meet with a volunteer face-to-face -to, -face to talk through their data and concerns. I really like that approach because it's really taking a positive approach and it's not engaging with the BS. Like that kind of stuff is so silly at this point and the research has been out for like over a decade. I really like their approach that they were just like, okay, we're gonna be positive, we're gonna show the positive stories and we're gonna use data to counter the nonsense. Who else had a smiley face on that one? Okay, since no one did, if you have a burning desire to share your answer on this, please come on up. One more person needs to share their answer on this one. This is such a fun question. I know there's some, I'm gonna have to call on someone. All right, yeah, come on up. We had mentioned, give some examples of a successful uh, fee waived adoption that's, that's been successful. They're not all um, gonna be bad and they're not all gonna be perfect, so. So is anybody here gonna meet with the person who wrote the op-ed? Ellen, would you meet with the person that wrote the op-ed? Um, it depends on, I think that it would be a good idea to call them and try to talk with them um, and talk, potentially see if you could send in a rebuttal letter also so that the, the broader audience also gets the right information. What would you do in this situation besides that? Um, we've had, obviously, that same situation happen. Probably every, a lot of people in the room have, and I think that sharing data is super important and also having the... Um, the, the experience, if you don't have the experience yourself, that where you have so many um, adoption events that have gone well and you haven't had any problems, all of, you know, we explain all of our animals are microchipped. If there's something bad happens to them and they end up in the city shelter or they come in dead, we, the city's going to alert us because the microchip is in them. So um, we've never seen anything like that happen. And then you also have all these articles. So it's kind of like just trying to give people more information. And I think putting it in the context of trying to get over all this folklore that has killed so many animals in shelters, people forget, people don't understand that, that it's part of this history that we need to get rid of that's based on fear and not facts. 
Cool. Okay, so scenario number three. Anybody who has a smiley face on scenario number three is going to bring their paper on up. Hold the shelter accountable. So some of the names of these groups, like the one in Austin, I think is called Volunteers Unchained. <laughs> these secret groups that happen. So this is what the heck do you do about that page? So why don't you tell us who you are and what your answer was? Um, I'm Aurora. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Animal Care Centers of New York City. Um, the first thing that we said we would do is that the government leader that saw it and reached out to us, we would invite them to the shelter so they could see what, we're, what we do, what the shelter looks like, if that animal is still there, see that animal specifically. Um, potentially if the volunteer is making this post on social media, not coming to the shelter, perhaps they are not aware of, or they feel that they can't. Um, so going directly to that volunteer and speaking with them about it, maybe there's some validity to their post um, and we can talk about that. Maybe there isn't and we can help them understand the context of, of what they're seeing. Um, and if generally this sort of Facebook page exists, um, maybe the volunteers as a whole don't feel like they have an opportunity to pri provide feedback. So if we're not already starting to have volunteer meetings, um, providing a channel, whether that's a Facebook page that we're involved in or an email account or something like that um, where they can forward comments, complaints, maybe praise occasionally, um, but some sort of like some sort of channel um, to, to encourage dialogue. Cool. Thank you. Did anybody else get a smiley? I thought we had one more for this one. Animal Care Centers of New York definitely uh, has experience in this area. So, <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm Deanna Uli. I'm with Operation Pets Alive. We are an uh, all volunteer rescue group in Montgomery County, Texas. What my role is, I'm the TNR coordinator. And we're going to get the community cat throughout the county. <laughs> Okay, uh, this has actually happened to one, we have two shelters and one of our shelters had a great volunteer group helping them and get, pulling dogs and you know, getting the dogs adopted, but they had two people in their group that, I mean, just a dog with a bone. And you know, any, any little infraction they could twist around to be negative, they, they did. And eventually that group, the whole group was asked to leave and that's, a, that's such a shame. Because uh, we need everybody uh, that we can get to help with the animals. But, uh, you know, what I would say back to the government official was, I'm glad you asked. Come see us anytime. Mm -hmm. We'll explain everything to you. You know, you, you don't have to have an appointment. Just drop in. Talk you know, to them. And give us a hand. You know, do everything you can to help. You know, meet with the volunteers and, you know, what are your concerns? Why are you so negative? And, you know, can you help us? Can you come up with the solution? You know, uh, you know, the, we have documentation that dog was fed and he ate his dinner and we took his, his bowl out to be washed and cleaned, you know, some kind of explanation. But, you know, if, if, the, if the kennels aren't as clean as you want them to be, by all means, come help us. You know, we can't, we have 400 dogs. You know, it's really hard to keep up with the poop. Come help us, you yeah. know. <laughs> Uh, you know, and ask the volunteers for solutions. How can we make you feel more comfortable with your situation? Um, you know, uh, is there, do we need more volunteers? Uh, do we need to get the Girl Scouts in here to help us? You know, whatever. You know, uh, you know throw out, you know, you. we need you to help us create a solution to this issue. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so. What are three themes we're hearing so far in the first three answers? What are three things that we're hearing come up again and again? Transparency. Yes, transparency, yeah, that's a good one. Communication. communication, yeah, the importance of communication. Particularly, we've heard people talking about face-to-face -face or telephone communication versus communicating in writing. What else? Asking for help. Yes, asking for help, always. Do you want to be part of solutions? Okay, I see some hands raised. Does that mean people think we missed something out of this answer? Okay, yeah. I think it's important to always ask, is there a kernel of truth? Yes. Always, yeah, they may be just going off to crazy land, but is there a kernel of truth? There almost always is, right? Yes. Uh, I mentioned that uh, with the transparency, I say, sorry, hold on. Oh, gosh. <laughs> 
with the transparency to say, yes, some dogs are scared in the shelter environment. It's very stressful, and that's why we need more fosters. Yes, yes, asking for help. All right, let's move on to number four. If you were part of number four. Oh. Need, yes. Uh, it's also good to have a process so people know if they see something that is dangerous, there needs to be some mechanism in place that they can get somebody's attention immediately. And we often don't have that mechanism, so trying to figure out what that is exactly. All right, for number four, I am Sabrina Wells. I'm the finance director at Austin Pets Alive. And so our group came up with, um, and this is related to disease outbreak and isolation, um, post information for each of the animals that are in isolation. And if bandwidth allows, provide pictures and updates. Uh, provide educational material for the reason that they're in isolation. I think that's a lot of um, why people get concerned. They don't quite understand why. And then three, maybe even invite a trusted volunteer, like one person, provide them with the appropriate uh, personal protective equipment, and then let them tour the ISO ward so then they can go back and report back to other volunteers and let them know what's really going on. Great, thank you. Okay, so ours was, oh, my name's Caroline. I'm the rescue foster coordinator for Galveston County Animal Services. Um, okay, so we said develop training and kind of similar, develop training and implement um, volunteers into those areas because I feel like you always need help with disease outbreak. So if you can train them and give them proper protective equipment, that's always helpful. And then um, if it's something that a foster could handle, trying to say, okay, well, let's get them into your home. You know, you can help um, make them feel better, get them out of here, and so we can open this up sooner. And then provide info and data and the uh, timeline for how long it's going to be closed off. I think that we sometimes also need to understand what an emergency disease outbreak is because in, in shelters, high life-saving shelters, if I... If we have a bunch of dogs with mild URI, that's not a disease outbreak. Those animals are still on public view. We have signage up asking people to be careful about disease spread. We have to really be careful that when we are isolating animals away from the public, especially for a long amount of time, that we have a good reason for doing so. And the communication part comes in by explaining the good reason. But even for serious disease outbreaks, we still have volunteers providing enrichment for those animals. They are not in true isolation. They're getting enrichment in TLC every day by volunteers. Okay, cats, 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 cats. Do you guys hear this in your shelters? Cats need more attention? Is that ever something that comes up? I mean, many animal shelters, if we go back to that pound model, they weren't built for cats. They were built for dogs. And so cats in many shelters were sort of this add-on that came much later, and they have been sort of second class. Their needs have been considered secondary. So this argument is one that definitely often has a kernel of truth to it. Um, but we made it more complicated and said, but what about this save rate issue? So this is your hardest one. So anybody who got a smiley face on this one, Come on up and share your answer. Hi, I'm David Smith from No Kill Colorado. Um, we came up with four, sorry, I have to read them. I don't have my glasses on. Senior campaign, uh, put together a senior campaign for adopt and spread the awareness about the seniors. Kind of give those volunteers something to let them know that you care. Um, show them the data. If it's 85 and 60, you can clearly go to your 12 volunteers and say, okay, well, we, we have both cats, senior cats and kittens. This is the data. What do you expect us to do with this? What, what, what would you do? What problem could you solve? Um, kitty cams to help uh, get them adopted. Putting cameras, this is kind of, this is probably not really a solution to the direct problem, uh, but using cameras actually so that you can put those online and get people to see both the kittens and the seniors. And the last one was you have 12 volunteers, so why not suggest every month six of you are going to be on kittens, six of you are going to be on seniors, and then you're going to rotate every month. And it could be three and nine, six and six, once a week, once a month, um, so that they're actually going back and taking care of both. Thank you. Anybody else get a smiley on this one? If you didn't, that's okay. Okay, so this group disclosed to me that they couldn't agree among themselves, and I think that's reflected in their answer. 
um, I think they're missing some things here. There's some good information, but what else would you do? Because there's a real issue here um, that they're misidentifying a problem. Um, Holly? Oh, I don't even mind. I would you do because we're recording you. You're going to be famous. <laughs> so one of the things that our group said was, I'm Holly, I'm from Austin Animal Center. Um, one of the things that we said was, um, so using what you said to focus on that last line is, get the kittens out of the shelter. Like, push foster really heavily on the kittens and so that all the cats that are left in the shelter, albeit the seniors, then have the attention of the staff and the volunteers because all of your kittens are in foster. Mm -hmm. and or outside adoption, um, you know, your pet smarts or whatever, pet sense places, put your kittens there so then the focus when people come to the shelter, it's all on the senior cats. Cool, so getting those cats that are easy to get to foster out quickly so that there is more time to pay attention to the animals in the shelter. What else? Linda? Hi, Miranda Hitchcock from Austin Animal Center. One of the things that we also talked about was that um, if we have a really passionate group of 12 volunteers who really believe in these senior cats, one of the first things we can do is ask them to develop a program for these senior cats. We can say, we're spending a lot of resources trying to save these kittens, but we care about these senior cats, so what do you want to come up with to help us save them? This is a really real topic, and I think Ellen can speak to this too because we do this thing where we are like, you solve the problem. And I feel like we're getting ourselves into a little bit of trouble with that. Um, we have had this issue in Austin with behavior dogs. Um, and people start to feel like all the last 10% is getting pushed onto volunteers. And so that can be a really big challenge. And I would add that if you're going to empower volunteers to start a specialty program or take accountability for a group of animals, you also make sure that your staff team is providing at least emotional support for them to do that, because um, that can be a really hard thing to ask a group of fairly disorganized volunteers to take on. Yes, I agree. But I would also suggest organizing them and organizing them with staff. Um, something that we're going through right now is because of that um, last 10% that Kristen's talking about is trying to integrate volunteers actually into the org chart um, with staff. So everybody knows how they work together. and. When volunteers can understand the financial constraints that we have and how many staff we can provide, then they can help. I mean, our staff is fairly movable. And so one of the questions I put out to volunteers is where do we want to put the paid people? Because the paid people, we only have a, a, a definite number, but we have a whole bunch of other volunteers. And so how do we integrate in a way that makes the most sense? Because we're kind of just duplicating efforts we're not talking to each other, we're not getting anything done as a team because it's staff versus volunteers. But um, I think there's, there's some real potential in trying to organize ourselves as a whole unit. The other thing that I would say is that, um, and I think we touched on this, is that don't fall into the trap of thinking a cat's a cat's a cat's a cat. Um, they're all different and people love different types of cats and so let people save what they are passionate about and don't think about obviously try to find solutions for the kittens, but it doesn't have to be those 12. So don't try to push people towards what you want, let them help with what they want. Which I think we said, so I think we're good. Yeah. So of these scenarios, which one, like, which one do you feel like um, spoke most closely to you? Was there, one, was there one that you feel like was more something that you've had to deal with repeatedly, or did they span kind of a range of things that you've encountered? Free adoptions, that's a big one. I'm really interested in your answers because it'll help us figure out what presentations we need to do next year that kind of dig down into the problems you're facing, yes? I think definitely the photograph of the dog cowering in the corner. I think that those kinds of things, though, slice both ways. Sometimes they lead to big change, even when they're not accurate mm -hmm. in terms of in municipal shelters, but it definitely creates the most um, outrage and the most attention and often media attention too. It's a tough one. Yeah. You know, I think one of the lessons learned for me being in a shelter where we have things like that happen is to just be really honest about it and to be really honest when we fail and talk about what we need to do better. Um, when I was at, when I came to PAC, they had turned the euthanasia cooler into a parvo ward. Um, so it was parvo puppies living in a, cool, a dead body cooler. 
Um, it was really, really, really horrifying, and it was put on social media, and we were like, yep, they're living in a dead body cooler, and we'd like to do better by them. And luckily, the community had already voted to support the bond to do better by them. Yes. Um, Heidi Hayes Hamilton, Ventura County Animal Services. These are animals that volunteers have a lot of time um, and effort invested in trying to correct something. And when they hit uh, that urgent kind of decision list, it's, it's a lot of upheaval, a lot of communication that's very emotional publicly, and that's uh, something that we, we see frequently. You don't have a microphone? Oh, I thought you were going to say something. Well, I can. Okay. <laughs> um, that, I think that is a really, really difficult um, situation. And I think we, the inside of the shelter and the outside, meaning staff and volunteers, I think we do need to keep working on solutions together. And I think that it often feels like a, an attack from the outside. and. Um, I know that's not intended, but that's the whole point of this lecture is we kind of need that activism and that pain point to create change. But, um, and I don't know what that change is. Nobody knows what to do with those dogs, which is why they end up on the kill list when we're trying to be a no-kill community. Um, so I think just continuing trying to be part of a uh, constructive conversation. But the pain's important too. And, and I think, if you're below 90% and you're putting a dog down, we need to be careful not to call it something it isn't and be really honest. We're all still killing for capacity when we're killing behavior dogs when we're full. Um, and yes, there are dogs that have caused harm to humans or animals and that are an immediate threat to public safety, but if they're not, we need to be really clear with our communities about why that decision's being made. And it's not because there's something, era, there's something untreatable about the animal itself. So what we were trying to do is give you some pointers on, on how to handle it, um, and we're by no means extra experts, but I think that maybe we can have a little bit of, um, just offer you some, uh, some structure around trying to, trying to sol solve for this. So they say that um, in media, you should only respond to voices that are powerful or influential. But I would say that we should make that a little broader, that if somebody's right, we should respond. If there's an easy solution that solves the problem that people are upset about, we should respond. Um, and if it's, I, I think that this is a lot like disease in shelters, which is way more my wheelhouse than everything else. But um, you know you have a distemper outbreak when you're getting a ton of complaints from the community, from adopters and from rescue groups. That's your tip off that you're having a distemper outbreak. It's not a whole bunch of sick dogs in your shelter. It's the complaints that are coming in. And so we need to think about that complaint mechanism more broadly. And so when you're getting a lot of complaints about a specific issue, it probably means you have a problem, even if you don't think you have a problem. Um, and so you should look into it. So what does working together look like? This is, again, just some um, structure that we're, we think could help. Um, it's, uh, let's see, so these are probably gonna come up weird. So this starts with you. So you investigate the problem yourself, um, and it has to be you. I've got, I have personally suffered by asking other people to look into things for me, and then the information I get back is not the same information that I would have found if I had done it myself. And so if it's a big enough issue, look into it yourself and try to determine if there's actually a kernel of truth or not. Um, get the facts. So I've, when we have a big enough problem, it's interviewing people, interviewing lots of the complainers and some of the people on the periphery of the complainers, um, going and directly observing what's going on, and then running our own data reports to collect our data. What is our data showing compared to what we're seeing and hearing? Um, get all those facts and then talk about them with your team. Pull your team in. Um, develop a skeleton process so your team's going to be smart enough to figure out like okay this is how we should handle this and so you get that process going get the easy stuff out of the way just get it off your plate solve it and don't keep talking about it just get it done um, and then the harder stuff develop some questions the questions you have internally you you're developing those to bring to a broader audience and so that might be we don't know how to manage this number of paid walkers and we have this number of dogs that need to get out twice a day and everybody wants them to have 20 minute walks and everybody wants staff to do it. 
okay, so what, that's a, we have that internal question. We don't know the answer. Let's write it down and that'll be part of what the next step is. So the next step is take it to the people who are involved in, in it. So it might be all of your dog walkers. It might go to 500 volunteers. Or if it's only the really gnarly behavior dogs, then maybe it's only 50 people that are handling them. But it's the people who are in it and um, you, don't, you don't want to cherry pick. You want every, all the voices to come in together. And then you hold a brainstorm session. Ask them the questions and get their feedback and don't argue with them. Because <laughs> that actually does happen. You, get, you ask a question and then people start telling you stuff and you start writing it on the whiteboard and you start defending and arguing and you want to just listen, just listen. And um, then bucket similar solutions together, which you're going to have, all, you're gonna have like 50 things, try to put them in three buckets and then create um, a smaller group. Take this back to a smaller group, smaller task force with staff and volunteer leads and they figure out what they're gonna do with those buckets. And then they bring it back to you and, um, and then the solution gets implemented in an actual protocol. There's deliverables, there's somebody responsible. So it's kind of like a, um, what I wanted to give is just sort of a structure that we, we are currently using and it's working really, really well to solve some of these problems that have been plaguing us, complaints that have been plaguing us for a long time are starting to finally get resolved because we're, we are following this methodology. So I do think there's something to it, but it, it's not scientific in any way. Um, so in, the, in an ideal world, um, everybody agrees on what's needed and everybody uh, advocates for the same goals and the shelter gets more resources because that's what everybody wants. Everybody wants the animals to get better and more. And so that would be the end goal we're all looking for. And um, I wrote might require compromise because um, it can't, you can't go into these thinking that you have the answer. If you have the answer, there's no point in the community discussion. Um, you might think you know the answer, but um, it would be far, it, would, it doesn't work if you just insert your own opinion on top of it and then um, ask people to execute it. So what happens next? The problems and solutions, the brainstorms, we have done so many brainstorms and they have been incredible for getting information that we didn't, we didn't even think of. It didn't even cross our minds. Um, and people are bringing forth solutions that um, are really great. So having more brains, I'm a big fan of more brains to solve big problems and it really does work. And um, the other thing is we, are, we have walked into at least one brainstorm session where we thought we were asking one question and the entire focus went a different direction on their number one problem that wasn't even on our radar at all. And so by having the, the discussion, we were actually able to solve the biggest pain point that wasn't, wasn't readily available to us. Um, and then people actually step up to help. It's reinvigorating our volunteer program by just pulling people in and saying, help us solve this. So in an ideal world, we'd have world peace, but that never happens. Um, and uh, so it's this cycle. And I think the more we can get comfortable with the cycle, the more we're going to be better together. And we need to recognize that activism is an essential ingredient that will help us get to the next level of animal care and animal service and um, let people dissent because it helps it's st you're stronger um, I was watching this uh, TED talk and the woman was talking about the the in war you have that the warrior who's in it they're on the ground they're killing people I guess and they're doing horrible things um, to try to just protect their territory but there's always a scout that's up in the tree and the scout that's up in the tree or up on the nearest hilltop is looking for the things that are going to be disasters in the near future as you walk over the prairie what's going to get them on the other side and you kind of have to be both people at the same time and it's hard, but you need the activist to keep showing up or you're never, you, you, that's how we improve. And so I like this little cycle. Ryan talked about it on the first morning um, about how you have the activism piece. The leaders need to do something with the information that comes from the activism um, and then the doers do the work. And then there's another gap found and then activists make a big noise about it and then people need to come up with a solution and then somebody has to do the solution and then there's another gap found. It's just gonna keep going and going and going because we're never gonna be perfect. But it's okay, that's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. Um, so that's it. I think we're, I don't know if we have time for questions. I don't think so. Not really. Not really. <laughs> Can we do one, one question? We had one hand go up. All right. Thanks, Ellen. Um, so I just wanted to add to that. Um, my name is Jay. I'm with Best Friends Animal Society and also Palm Valley Animal Center. 
Um, so from the activist standpoint, activism is incredibly important, and y'all have been stressing that. Um, what I would just reiterate is that if you are an activist and you're coming to the table with real, real problems, and, and obviously those real problems and those pains need to be heard and they need to become, come to the light, I would just encourage you to also be open-minded whenever you are communicating those so that you can be receptive to what's actually taking place within the shelter or within you know, the environment that you are um, bringing issues to the table with. Um, and then also some um, possible... Yeah, but also don't trust us. Don't trust us. Ask questions. I agree that you need to be open-minded, but you need to make sure to keep pushing. Your advocate role is not to make friends. Your advocate role is to save lives. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that can be done in a very collaborative way. Not Definitely not saying um, to, to be close-minded, not saying to trust them, not saying any of that, but to dig into the data, um, to understand the problems and, and realize what might actually be taking place past what's, what's currently being seen in that moment. Cool, thank you. Yeah, and if somebody has completely unreasonable demands and they're not listening at all, then one of the best things you can do is pull them off to the side and talk to them separately in a separate meeting. Just get them alone and have a real conversation face to face um, yeah. because in a group, people become a pack and can really just you know keep going after you and not have any rhyme or reason to it but i think most people hopefully except for the one or two percent can um come around to understanding the real issues that you've got mm -hmm. thank you all